So it's been a week, and I've had a lot of time to look online for some famous celebrity mug shots, Ken. I came up with them after I looked at this. You, Ken Belanger oh, oh. from, what is that, 93, 94? Yeah, maybe in that era. A beautiful shot, a beautiful picture right there. Hey, with what I'm about to show you, you look the best at all these people. This is my favorite one. Nick Nolte. Look at that hair. Nice. Look at that. Nice. What is wrong nice. with this guy? Nice. Looks like he combed his hair the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> or he was carrying a bomb, one or the other. And Michael Jackson, 2003 mugshot. He was picked hey. up on suspicion of child molestation charges. We won't speak ill of the dead. There's nothing left to say about this. Then, James Brown, I believe this was 1983. I'll have to double check that. But look at that. Look at that face. Look how happy he is to be in prison. Yes, and uh, last great. but not least, Snooky from Jersey Shore. If you ask me, she kind of looks a little bit like a cross between a caveman and Grimace from McDonald's. Good, good analogy. See... And now we go back to you, Ken Belanger from 93-94. That's, that that's not looks, that bad. Look at that, that hair. Like Look at that flow. Look at that, that, that handlebar mustache. Like, that, is, that is a good-looking nice. guy right there. That almost looks like a Picasso painting. You sure that's hey, real? Almost. Let, let me ask you a question, Ken. If, if your kid came home with a haircut like this, would you make him go get it chopped off? I'd be proud of him. I'd be proud of him. Look, see, you'll notice... Both Ken and I got haircuts last week. All cleaned up. Yeah, look at this. Clean cut All on the side up. and everything. All, cleaned up. All right. We don't have a lot of time today. A lot of things I want to get to. You ready to go? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Meaningless games. The season's almost over for most teams. And guys like you, guys like me, who, you know, didn't play a lot of minutes in the NHL, they finally got a chance to step up. What was it like for you at the end of the season? Well, let's, let me rephrase that. Meaningless games is only a term used in the media. Meaningless games doesn't exist in the locker room. Meaningless games doesn't exist anywhere in the game of hockey who's involved to management, ownership, the fans. Meaningless games is a media terminology saying you're knocked out of the playoffs. Let's not forget, this is, a, this, is not their, this is not a game to the players. This is their job. This is their livelihood. So when you say meaningless games, it, every player plays every night for his job. For, for his new contract, for his next shift. So when these teams are out of the playoffs mid-Christmas, I was in the Islanders and where I had my great flow going with the hair, and we were out of the playoffs by Christmas time every year. There you go. That picture there, we were out of the playoffs every year by just after Christmas. Now, you show up to the rink every day, and you're fighting for your next shift. So the, the fact of players, the thought of, of being in the playoffs, it, it's a bit disappointing. You can plan your summer. Uh, any trips you're going to do, but the reality is you show up every day for your job and you're fighting for your job, and that's the same thing for the management. You know, okay, what about job. the guys? What about guys who play top line minutes? Like at the end of the season, when, like I said, meaningless games, some of these guys have really emotionally checked out. Correct? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, uh, the guys who who've played all year, guys who may be lagging some injuries, uh, you know, those games, you know, they're thinking about the next big contract. Let's not forget the average NHL career is two and a half years. So are you going to put yourself in that predicament to play potential means game where you've got a leg and knee injury that's going to hinder a new contract or maybe you're going to hinder your career for the rest of your, you know, the rest of your future? You know, that, it, it, it's in the back of your guys' minds. There's no question. I'm not going to do that. But what about if the coach tapped you on the shoulder when you guys got a power play and said, get out there? Do you ever look back at him like, hey, what are you, crazy? No, I look back at him and go, it's about time. I've been sitting here for a whole game. What have you been waiting for? That's what, that's what yeah. my look is. And then you go back to uh, this Ken Belanger, the junior Ken Belanger, who scored 30 goals in one season. Pretty boy. So that Ken Belanger, how many minutes did that guy get in the OHL? I used to probably play uh, probably 12 to 15 minutes a game, regular shift. So at the end of the season when you guys were done in the OHL, you were kind of ready to go home. But other guys who always- were – who are the Ken Belanges in the NHL playing in the OHL, those guys those guys really probably were looking forward to the end of the season. Absolutely. I mean, you got All guys right. who play a hard-nosed season. You know, at the end of the year comes by, you, it's nice to take a month or two off to uh, refresh up and, uh, you know, get back in shape. True. Let's move on. Every single week we hear this debate. Why do we need fighting in hockey? So 
I personally don't really think we do need fighting in hockey. You obviously disagree, but why do we need it? Well, it's the same reason. I don't. I don't think. I don't agree. We need the media to negative backlash the game, but it's there. Why do we need it? Let's play a game where we have absolutely guys running around hitting each other. Nobody's fighting. Hockey is a release valve in the game. I've talked about it day in and day out. When there's a fight, the game completely calms down. When there's no fight, you got guys running around. You got Matt Cook running around doing what he's doing. There's no fight. There's no repercussion. It's part of the game. It's always been a part of the game. It's it's in the history of the game. I totally disagree with you. Remember the Olympics last year? Look at look at that. Canada the Olympics, gold medal in the Olympics. You know what? Bad comparison. Did you see any Olympics. fighting in the Olympics last year? You you don't need. You, let's see. You wonder why there's no fighting in the Olympics because you've got one aggressive team, which is in North America, Canada. U.S. are very aggressive. Other than the Swedes play somewhat, the Finns play a little bit North American style with body checking. There's no reason for any fights because you've got one team that are physically pounding the other team. I tell you right now, the teams that Canada plays against the Finns, they're, they're, it's a very gritty, gutty game. And there's no fighting Olympics because you're going to get kicked out. They're there, for, they're there for the championship for the gold so, medal. You don't, now, see, you don't no, see guys like Ovechkin running around hitting people? You don't see guys like... Uh, uh, some of the Swedish players like Nicholas Cronwall, you don't see those guys throwing big body checks. I think yeah, that's but, totally that's totally false. The bottom line is the Olympics last year were some of the best hockey anyone has ever seen. There was not one fight. So tell me why does the NHL need to fight? Well, because you got two aggressive teams battling. The Europeans have played a completely different style game. They're a completely finesse game, which NHL's tried to do, which we can see they've made a mess out of because of nothing but headshots. Let's go to European League. How many? How, how bad are their headshots over there? They've kept their same style of play. They've never had fight in their league, and they've never had an issue. We've had fight in our league as part of our game. Now they're trying to take it out, and look what's happening. They're creating chaos. I don't know about you, but I'd rather see four lines of skilled players than three lines of skilled players and a bunch of muckers. Well, you, you're going to get what you're getting now. You've got guys like Matt Cook running around. You've got four lines of skilled players. You've got your guys running around that are injuring players. This is what happens. So you're you're getting what you want. You're getting headshots and okay. injuries. So Matt Cook, like you said, runs around hurting players. But what what does fighting do? Yeah, obviously it doesn't scare him from doing what he he's be, doing. And he no one has to fight around. him because he doesn't want to fight. He wouldn't be running around if someone was going to take his head off. I can tell you right now. So your problem is with the instigator, not with fighting yeah. itself. The instigator is re- it, the instigator is it really hindered the game. Okay, let's move on then. Last week on Off the Record. Uh, Wayne Gretzky said that he thinks the NHL should see what would happen if they put the instigator rule back in. By, uh, by that, I mean take it out. What do you think would happen if that happened? Smanko McSorley, who went up and down Gretzky's wing? I, look, I like Gretzky so much, I got two of his jerseys behind me. So I see that. He, two identical great, Kings jerseys. Greatest player of all time. Now, when he says something like that, people better start listening. He played his whole career with, with Smanko running up and down his wing. Never had never had to worry about uh, a concussion or getting an open ice hit. So why, why don't people wake up and start listening? So does it seem to you like the NHL is kind of – they haven't really adapted to the idea of all or nothing? Because when you have the instigator rule, and like, yeah, sure, you get a couple stage fights, but you don't see the real good stuff that you used to see. Well, we, we, we're not looking for the stage fights. We're looking for the bell to regulate your own game. you got guys like Gary Bettman making too much money. His head's full of money. He should go back to basketball where it's a very non-contact game. Now we've got a hockey game where he doesn't know what the hell to do. He's making some owners happy. The other the other half, the owners are selling their teams because they can't make money because they can't sell tickets. The economy's well, crushing. apparently he's making a lot of owners happy because he just got a big raise, of, I think $7.5 million a season for six more years. That, yeah, well, to me, seems like he made a lot of owners happy. But like I said, to me, I don't know why we need it because it's a physical game. And in my opinion, if you really want to go out there and get someone back, you can pay them back with a clean body check. And that's the one thing that hockey has over every other sport other than the NFL. Hockey's built on emotion. Emotion builds up energy. Energy needs a release. It's internal energy. What do you do with it? You release it from... A big hit. If someone does something dirty. You go out and fight. You release the energy of the game. The crowd loves it. It's a big sell. Can't you can't you release your energy by throwing a massive body check? What if you can't get that body check in? Well, then obviously, if you can't throw a clean body check, you're probably not skilled enough to belong in the NHL. I would disagree with that. Some guys are quicker. Some guys are faster. 
Bottom line is, game needs to instigate a roll back out. I guarantee it, you'd have less guys running around. Injury rates would go down. All right, let's move on. You said it best. Uh, what's the difference in today's game between a goon and an enforcer? Well, I don't like the term goon because when I played, I was called a goon. What is a goon? A goon is a guy who's basically going to show up every night to stick up for his teammates. Now, is that, is that someone who's frowned upon by the media, by the crowd, or by his teammates? Absolutely not. The term is old school. You're talking goon. We're talking slap shot. We're talking handsome brothers running around chopping guys in the head. This day and age, there's, there's no goons in the NHL. You've got guys oh, sitting on the bench. Trevor one Gillies ship. isn't a goon? You don't think Trevor Gillies is a goon? Guy can't Absolutely skate. Absolutely not. He can't all What's play Trevor the game. His role? job is to go out there and hurt somebody. His job is to go out there and finish and make room for the team. That's his job. His job description is not goon. It's enforcer. It's energy line. What's energy line? Go out there and do something. But didn't he really hurt his team more than he helped them by taking, like, seven minutes in penalties and giving the other team a seven-minute power play? That's a disciplinary action that he's got it as, as a young young player in the league has to look back and reflect on it. But it's a learning curve. I mean, it's a difficult role to play. He's got the weight of the crowd and the team sitting on his back in his contract next year. He's got to go out and do something. So he does what – out of reaction. He did what he felt he had to do. And he's got to look back and reflect and see – Maybe next time he does, he's got to control himself. But that that's a role, and those are the risks and the rewards that that, that, that role has. Okay. Dan Ham Hughes suffered a concussion last week. He said that after the previous concussion he had, if he suffered another one, he'd have to seriously look at, at quitting. He's going to walk away from $20 million if he does quit. Do, do you respect guys like this who say, you know, family is more important than hockey, or do you want guys on your team who are willing to literally die on the ice? Double-edged sword. I, I retired the game of hockey because of concussions. My last year, I left halfway through the season with concussions. Why? Because of my family. I'm thinking long-term. But the reality is to come out and blatantly say with a $20 million contract to say, oh, if I get one more, I'm going to walk away. That's just stupid ridiculous. Um, he didn't say he would walk he, away. He said he'd have to consider walking away, which I, I kind of respect because he's saying, you know, my family's more important. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of guys out there who say that, but I don't know if there's a lot of guys out there who actually would do that. Yeah, I mean, that's a media, that, that's a great media, a good PR piece to say, hey, I'd probably walk away for the concussion issue. But the reality is, the time is, he's not going to walk away. He's going to wait till he tries to feel better. And he's, he's, he's a competitive athlete. That's what, that's what got him to be at the NHL. He's very competitive. I did that myself. I took a year and a half off uh, from the game because of concussion issues, and I just couldn't stay away. And I went back and made another shot. And it, it's, it's part of the, the passion and the athlete and the you know, competitor that, that drives these athletes to the top of the game is the, is the competition. Okay. So before we wrap this up, i got to ask you about what Mark Recchi said about the, the Montreal Canadiens and Max Pacioretty. He said that he thinks the Habs were embellishing Pacioretty's injury to try and get Chara suspended. Do you, do you think teams actually do this, or do you think Recchi's kind of a little bit out there? No, I, I wouldn't say all teams, but the Montreal media, the Montreal team, I think probably blew the incident way out of control. Uh, so would they intentionally, would their strategy be no? But let's on the same side say, absolutely, it's Montreal Canadiens, one of the oldest rivals in sports. So if they have a chance to get an upper edge on saying, let's maximize, let's try to maximize this penalty by saying it, it's, you know, blowing this up worse than it really was. Uh, I would, I could see the media doing that. Absolutely. Would the trainers give the report? Would the management give the report of worse? I think the speculation what happened in Montreal is that they speculated concussion. They speculated worse. Someone got to run with it. The media took it and just blew it up out of control. So strategy, Bruce Brujo, strategy against Tampa Bay Lightning. It's all, you know, mental game strategy. So if there's a way for a team to get an edge and a way for a media to sell papers, they're going to do it. You're talking about when Boudreaux said that Downey and Stamkos dive too much? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Fair enough. Uh, we got to wrap this up. We're pretty much done. And for all of our friends, whether it be Nick Nolte, Michael Jackson, James Brown, and Grimace from McDonald's, we got to wrap this up and say we'll be back next week.